Welcome back to the Daughters of the Moon podcast. We're grateful that you can join us for another week. We and, certainly are. And we have a special guest, Steph Jagger. Steph is a world rec- record setting endurance athlete, author of two best selling memoirs, and a sought after facilitator, speaker, and coach. Her work centers on helping people live a more intuitive life. She's a catalyst for those wanting to spend more time in the presence, able to connect with themselves and the world around them in a more spacious and meaningful way. Her grounded yet soulful approach is known to move and inspire audiences of all sizes. So welcome, Steph. I was I was really excited. I did read your memoir about you and your mom. I thought that was very a wonderful story, very riveting and heartfelt. So can you tell us a little bit about how you got here on your journey and oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I I can. Um you know I think the the easiest way to do that is to say I grew up in Vancouver, British Columbia. And I am a Capricorn rising. And so I like to climb mountains, <laughs> literal <laughs> and metaphoric. And I think, you know, I, I was so interested in talking to you because I love the idea of, of the ways that we initiate through the various different stages of our life. And I think when I look back to, to you know, explain how I got here, I look at the maiden version of me. And, and I think about the way that she charged through the world and was in Vancouver and wanted something more and different, but couldn't quite articulate or know or understand what that was and, and kind of galloped into the snowy world. And um, that, that really made up my first book. I went um, around, I left Vancouver. I sold everything. I quit everything. I packed my pair of skis and traveled around the world in search of snow. And I found, you know, myself and love and so much more that's in Unbound, the first memoir. And, and then landed in, in the U S um, and I think have been attempting to understand that call into adventure from the maiden version of myself and how that's going to initiate into archetypal mother version of myself, which is really so much of what I think the second book and the second journey with my mom, you know, did for me. And to where I am now, which is really initiating myself into what I would think of as the as the third master initiation, at least in the feminine energy, which is into Autumn Queen and really understanding how I harvest uh, all, all the seeds that I planted. And so how did I get here? I mean, I think I was initiated into all of this is, is the is the gist of it and followed that. I think that Capricorn in me is like, okay, there's a challenge ahead. Like I shall say yes. (laughs) So, so that's um, a little bit of how I've arrived. If that makes any sense. That makes total sense. And I'm also a Capricorn and my mom is a Virgo. So both very earth signs, both very on that, (laughs) that passionate journey to find things to inspire you. I think as, as we are right, we want to climb those mountains. We want to find what inspires us and sparks our fire. So, yeah. so how do you find that that runs into your everyday life of trying to find that spark in your fire now that you're in your, where you are in your journey? Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, as I said, I mean, I think these, these, these different initiations. So, so I speak a lot in archetypal initiation and in story and mythology. It's one of the reasons that I love writing. It's one of the reasons that I love coaching is because I, and and mentorship is because I get to sit inside of people's stories, people's own mythology as it's being created. And so for me, you know, what are those quintessential ways I think match the different initiations that I've gone through? You know, when I, again, as I said before, when I was a maiden, it was really about, you know, who am I in this world? What is my identity in this world? It's a quintessential maiden voyage, you know? How, what do I think of myself? What do others think of me? And how am I going to carve out a unique and signature identity in this world? And I think, you know, traveling and skiing around the world was such a part of that. I think that evolved, that that same adventurous spark evolved when I was moving into Archetypal Mother, which I think has a quintessential question of what shall be created through me? What It's an invitation into the physical body to, to learn how to become like a channel for creative intelligence, creative life. And I think that, you know, involved the journey with my mom and involved the journey of like learning how to, you know, write 
books, which was not in my mental plan when I was younger. And, and when I look back at those two, what they show me is um, a couple of things. One, there is an ability inside of me that is a, that is a spark, my, my unique kind of spark that has to do with endurance. Like I can sit, it's, 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 I showed this in the ski trip and I think I've shown this to myself as a writer. You know, I can sit in a relatively uncomfortable place and find comfort and flow state there. And I was looking back, you know, there's been all this interesting astrology lately and it's, and, and I know this podcast is going to be coming out a little bit later than we're having the conversation, but I was prompted recently to go back to 2018 and 2008 and read a handful of journals. And I found one well before the ski trip, I was in my mid twenties and I found a journal that, that said something along the lines of, I would like to move at such a speed that I am able to find slow. <laughs> and I would like to sustain that place. And I understand that some people think of that as like suffering. I, I don't really believe in creating our own suffering and staying there, but I, some people think of it as suffering, but I think of it as, as bliss. Like I understand how to get into an uncomfortable place and, and find a flow state there. So for me, you know, there was mental places when I was younger, there were physical places when I was doing the ski journey. You know, as I move and mature through my life, though, those are now emotional places. You know, we're experiencing loss as, as we age, as we mature, there's diagnosis, there's loss, there's kids moving out, there's, you know, a whole bunch of different challenges that it's like, oh, I know how to do this. It's just in a different body, you know, not the mental body, not the physical body. Now it's in the emotional body. How do I do that? You know, as we age and move into the later initiations of our life, I think that becomes a challenge of the spiritual body. You know, so these are all happening. And I think, I think that's the unique spark for me is I understand for me personally, what it is to sit for a long time, have a kind of endurance approach and find flow states, creative energy, ease, wonder, awe, and aliveness in those places. And I think that's what I'm after. Yeah, I and I think that's an important thing, right? Because we have to find what gives us that spark. And I loved what you said about, you know, going so fast that you find the stillness in that. Because I think, you know, we do as as really in everyday life, we all rushing through life. And I don't think that's where you were going with that statement. But but I think that's such a good um, dream to have that you can recognize and acknowledge and appreciate that stillness in all that fastness. Absolutely. You know, for me, when I was younger, this a lot of the pace that I was after really had to do with the athleticism that I was involved in. And, and then moving from that into a lot it much, you know, sitting and writing a book is not an athletic endeavor. It's you're sitting for a long period of time and, and still being able to tap into a certain kind of pace as in the thermal or the current that I'm going to find creatively might be moving at a swift pace. And do I have the capacity? Do I have the energetic practices to be okay running at that big pace or that fast pace and to be able to find stillness in that place, which is very different, you're right, than the hectic go, 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 go. I've got to be in 10 million places at once kind of pace that is a lot of our everyday lives. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so do you think there's something that we should learn as people of how to kind of take that hectic part of our lives and, and refocus that or redirect that into still being active and still being enduring what we're going through, but not the chaos and the stress of the hecticness? Absolutely. I think it has to do with, you know, what you, what you read in the bio, this is a I usually am a person who's a, a bit of a catalyst to, for the for being in the present moment. And so I do think what we need to learn is that 
for me, the way I would define it is that all wellness means being in the same place at the same time, means having all of our bodies in the same place at the same time. So what I mean by that is our ability to thrive and move at a pace, our ability to be present, to be able to be slow inside of that pace, means that we have to have our mental body, our physical body, our emotional body, somatic, energetic, spiritual, in the same place at the same time. Most of us have a mental body that shoots into the future to try and pre-solve problems that don't even exist yet. Okay. Yeah. Oh, we got a, we got a thumbs up yeah, on that, thumbs up on that one. <laughs> Most of us have our emotional body living somewhere in the past. You know, we're triggered by things. We got a, We got another thumbs up for that. Somewhere in the past that we're ruminating over past hurts and we're bringing those into the present moment and when we stretch ourselves that way putting our mind projecting our mind into the future throwing our emotional body into the past you know it takes a toll on our physical body okay. and so we might get injured we you know which also takes us out of the present and so for me that kind of how, how do i bring myself into the presence into presence with all of my bodies there which, which also creates a different definition for me of authenticity and alignment. A lot of us think of authenticity as, as, you know, do I walk my talk? Do I have a certain set of values, things that I think? And do I follow those up with my behaviors? That's great. That is fantastic. And is my somatic, physical, emotional body there nodding along can i feel it can i feel myself in that moment doing those things mm. quite often when i am there in that moment doing those things there's like a hitch or something i go oh what's that <laughs> let me let me slow down enough to understand what that what's being communicated to me and then when i'm all together i can move very swiftly mm -hmm. that make any mm -hmm. sense it does it totally yeah. makes sense I'm a very action person too. And yeah. I really am. I'm always doing something. And even when I used to clean the house and things like that, I was in 12, everywhere, river room doing it. Right. And then I kept saying to myself over the years, like, why, <laughs> why can't you just do that one thing and then just leave it? If you come back to it, that's okay. Yeah. It, you'll come back to it sometime. But why fret about what is? Yeah. Because we have to sort of, station ourselves and get ourselves together um, otherwise that's when we trip and fall that's when we do silly things that because we're not in the moment like you said well and you know to to invite ourselves to that place is there's, there's a poet marie howe and i've heard her talk about this in context of a writing exercise she gave her students um which was to sit down and look at whatever was on the desk let's say there was a a, a glass of water on the desk and to write it without using metaphor, to just write it as it is. And everyone was like, oh God, this is boring. It's just so water on a desk. We don't want to do this. And, and they go off and they do the assignment and they come back and it's, it's, it's stunning, it's stunning work. You know, they're just describing there was a clear glass on a brown desk with water slipping down the side, creating a pool, uh, staining the table. It's just a really beautiful, simple thing. And then mm -hmm. she said, okay, go back and use metaphor. And none of them wanted to. Now, the point of it is it's hard for us to endure a thing. Because when we're there in the moment, things come up, emotions come up, boredom comes up, grief comes up. We don't, rage might come up, anxiety might come up. We, we don't want to have those things come up. And so we kind of cut them off and we stretch ourselves into the future and into the past. But then we're also missing the joy and the excitement. And, the, you know, we can't just <laughs> cut off one side and not the other. So so we miss okay. a lot. So I do. I really think it's an invitation into, into the present and into the ability to endure a moment. And, and you know, again, another poet, Mary Oliver, attention is the beginning of devo devotion is the beginning of attention. You know, this idea that there is such beauty to be found inside of those moments. And it does it's it's a paradox you know it does mean that we're moving slower somehow but everything also seems to move at a swift pace in that in that place you know 
And that's, I think always when I'm working with people, when, when we're introducing paradox, when they're saying, well, I'm feeling this, but I'm also feeling this, it's a good thing. Yes. That's usually a sign that we're, that there is, that we are in the present. Cause when all of us is there, there are going to be a little bit of paradox or complex feelings or, you know, things that aren't um, binary or black and white. Right. You know, and we have to be okay and have the capacity to increase our capacity to sit in that kind of beautiful discomfort. Yeah. And, and I think that's hard for people, right? Cause when you feel like you're going through inner turmoil, it, it is really hard to find that peace and joy in that moment of our lives to, to be grateful for the things that are around us and to just go through that experience, even if it is painful to know that there, you know, you will come out the other side of it. So do you, do you have any tips on like, how do you work through some of that stuff when you're feeling that sort of angst when you're in that position where you're like, oh, I'm so uncomfortable. How do you sit in that presence? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think there's there's a couple of things that I'll say. One is going to be kind of like um, blunt and then one's going to be more, maybe a little bit more of a tangible tip. <laughs> The, the more of the blunt thing is, is goes back to initiation. So I talked about, you know, some of the um, kind of yin energy initiation, but there's a, there's a master initiation inside of our life, which is life, death, life. And this can be, you know, big capital D death. And this can be metaphorical, uh, smaller things and, and, and even large things that aren't, you know, the ultimate death, large things like, you know, the ending of a marriage or the loss of a job or, you know, children leaving the house, you know, there's, there's a different kind of thing appearing. So that initiation, life, death, life. We don't like the emotions. Western society does not like the emotions involved in the death part. So we do our best to avoid that. We push it off, right? And we, we go, no, 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 no. I'm going to push it off. I'm going to hold it away. I'm going to clean my house instead. And um, in doing so, I'm going to create more life. I'm going to, I'm going to stay in the living part for longer. What that actually does is it suspends the initiation. And over time, it creates a living death. We are numb. We are zombies. We are living in the past and the future. We aren't present. You know, we can't feel very much anymore. We get a little bit more rigid. You know, we might get resentful. You know, these different things. And and so I think as a society, we have to understand that that when the, those emotions come up, that what what can we do to increase our capacity to hold them and to accompany them and companion them through whatever period of time that we've got. Now there's lots of nuance to this. Um, That's a really, really hard thing to do if you're a caretaker and simultaneously grieving for one thing, you know, that's, I, I, I could go down that rabbit hole, but I won't. If you have space and time, generally speaking, to move into those, I'm gonna say two tips. Number one, our bodies give us signals all day long about what they need Mm -hmm. and including um, what they need to soothe and help our own emotions. We are very good at not listening to our bodies. (laughs) And so the first piece of work I always do is I I work with people through reestablishing a connection with your body where it's telling you something and you're going, oh, I hear you. That's right. That's important. And I respect you enough to fulfill that need. Right? So we start very well. What are the most foundational needs of our existence? I need to go to sleep. I need to use the washroom. I need to drink or eat. I mean, I don't know about you, but there's a lot of days that I get to like two o'clock in the afternoon and I'm like, I'm famished and I haven't had a drink and I think I'm going to pee my pants. Like, <laughs> yes. surely, surely my body was giving me signs before I left Target that I had to use the washroom. Like, why did I not, why did I think it was like, nope, get in the car, got to get home, got it. <laughs> and now I'm running in the door about to have an accident. Like, I'm a 43-year-old woman. Can I, can I, can we do this a little better? Like, why do I need a water bottle with markings of what time I'm supposed to drink to t- Tell me, I'm surely my body is telling me it's thirsty. That's correct. That's so true. Right? So I start there. Are you, oh, I'm thirsty. I'm just going to pause this meeting 
and run and grab a glass of water, you know, you know, I have to use the ladies room, you know, Hey kids, before we get in the car, mom's just going to dip in and use the, use the washroom. Anybody else need to go before, you know, this, will we develop a relationship with those parts of ourselves? The more we listen to the foundational needs, the more the intuitive, fleeting, emotional parts that are communicating, the more they will speak up and understand, oh, she might listen, <laughs> right? Yeah. That's for sure, number one. The other thing that I like to tell people is emotions are emotions. They're energy in motion in our body. They're sensations we feel moving around our body that we give a name to, right? So we might feel something bubbly and effervescent moving through our stomach and up through our chest, maybe giving us goosebumps. And we might say that's excitement. Right? Yeah. We might feel something moving very hot and very quick and moving through our legs, up through our bellies, up through our throats. And we might call that or anger. <laughs> Depends. <laughs> but usually no, we call that fine. anger, right? <laughs> <laughs> We might feel a kind of um, density um, inside of our bodies and a, and a desire to kind of collapse and something heavy in our chest. We may call that sadness. For the most part, well, let me back up and say all energy wants to do is move from one form to the next. A little moth wing that is outside on my porch right now is not going to take very much time or a leaf is not going to take very much time to move from one form to the next. This wooden desk will take a little bit longer. This metal cup will take much longer, right? It's energy. It wants to move from one form to the next. Emotions, generally speaking, this has been studied in, in brain science and neuroscience and emotional sciences. They typically take 30 seconds. 30 seconds. It's crazy. Oh, right? It's crazy. Now, if we've got a whole bunch of it stored and we've never really let any out of the bag before, that might take a little bit longer. We might have to like open up the bag of worms and we might cry for some time. But <laughs> generally speaking, when we're engaged in this practice, about, you know, 30, 60, 90 seconds. So we might feel an emotion. Let's say it feels quite uncomfortable. Maybe there's anxiety. Maybe there's shame. Shame is one that feels really uncomfortable, right? Shame's coming up in my body. I feel kind of a redness in my cheeks. I feel like I might be sick to my stomach and I go, ooh, that... One, that feels like shame. That's a lot of shame coming in my body. There's two things we normally do. One, we normally go, I don't like that. And I'm going to push it some. I'm not going to feel this. I'm going to put it somewhere in my body. Why don't I put it in my hips? <laughs> Just let it stay there and never move. And then we get injuries, you know? Mm -hmm. The second thing we do is we go, you know... This feels so uncomfortable. And you know who might be better at dealing with this is my brain. So I'm going to kick this up into my brain and I'm going to ask my brain to create a concise and a clear narrative about this to solve it. That's not what our brain was meant for. Our brain is meant for taxes and Excel spreadsheets and a little bit of strategy. Our body was made to feel the shame and let it go. And so to your question, you know, what do I do? I, I had a... I saw a phone call, a phone number come up on my phone the other day, and I immediately have felt shame coming out of my body. I went, oh, that's sh one, that's shame. Wow, that's a lot of shame in my body. Two, I'm just going to sit with this for a second. Like, that's, huh, that's a lot of shame. No judgment, no narrative. I'm going to take a deep breath. I'm, gonna say, I'm not going to call them back right away. I don't want to call them from this shame. I'm just going to sit here and just be like, I'm okay. Like, is there anything like, I'm just in my kitchen. Is there anything to be ashamed of right now? Like my coffee maker's going, like maybe there's a few dirty dishes in the sink. Like I'm okay. I don't, there's nothing here to be ashamed of. Interesting. That must be old. That must be old. And I don't want to live in the past. So I'm okay. Energy in motion. Energy is best met and moved with a movement and a sound. So I might shake my arms and be like, oh, 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 that's a lot of shame. I might make a sound. <sighs> okay. I think I'll call them back. 
I'm okay. Those, that's an example of how we move through, right? Of how we hold that. Some are much larger than others. James, shame's the one that usually knocks me. Like I usually have to actually sit down, <laughs> you know, I'm like, whoa, that is gross. It just feels so gross in my body. Mm -hmm. like, oh, when we understand, it's just a sensation in my body. I do not have to give this a narrative. I do not have to create a victim villain like what if i was what if there was no villain here? i mean sometimes there are villains that you know those are that's important to understand but what if i just felt this what if my job was just to feel this and then decide what i would like to do after i felt it mm -hmm. you know we see this with kids kids are kids are such a great example right kids Kids come over, let's say you've got a kid and they're really frustrated and you go, oh, sweetheart, we, you know, did what, what, ha you're so frustrated. It looks like you're frustrated. What happened at school? And they went, Tommy told, stole my favorite pencil. Like, oh my gosh. That's so frustrating. Do you want to let some of that out of your body? And they go, Mah! they make a movement and sound. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like kick that around a little bit, swing your feet a little bit. That's frustrating. And Mah! go, Okay. Do you want to ask Tommy for the pen back tomorrow? Yeah. Okay. Sounds like a plan. You know, we see this all the time. 30, 90 seconds. And if it's, if it's a kid that's crying, I love it because they usually go like this at the end. They're like. <laughs> <laughs> that's it's, a sign. True. it's a sign that they're, you know, moved through an emotion. Oh, ooh, that was sad. Good deep breath. Yeah. I, and I think that's important because I think, you know, you're, I like how you say that because you're moving through the emotion. You're not really, um, you're not allowing it to really take hold of you. You're just saying, this is what I'm feeling, right? I'm feeling guilt. I'm feeling shame. I'm feeling anger. I'm feeling happiness, whatever yeah. it is. Right. Cause it can be the opposite of the good thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then you're just moving through it. You're not staying there stagnant and allowing that because I think in everything that I've heard and read and things like that, that is how we create disease in our body, right? Because we're, like you said, putting it on our hips and then we're like, oh, why is my back so sore? Why is my back so sore? sore? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. we're storing that up and we don't just do one thing, we just like compound it on top of each other. Right. We're holding ourselves I mean, back as well. Yeah, right? absolutely. You know, we them. we we push it somewhere and we ignore it. We're very good at that. Or, I mean, if if we want to make an emotion last, we tell ourselves a story about it. I mean, I can tell you, even in my own life, I don't do this perfectly. I'm human as well. I mean, I've got some emotions that I've created stories for that have lived for not 90 seconds, like they've lived for decades. You know, I mean, it's like, oh, okay, we know how to do that too. Oh, definitely. And, yeah. and oftentimes, you know, this is this is an interesting example. I mean, I think oftentimes for me, what's happened when I've sat with, whoa, what's that feeling? Then there's like a root underneath it. So, a great example oftentimes is anger. Like, I feel anger. I'm, I feel so angry at this person that they did this thing. You know. And when we actually sit with the emotion or let it out and let it process, we go, okay, what else is there? Sometimes there's something underneath that. Like, oh my gosh, I'm so sad. I, I'm angry because this happened. And underneath that is I'm so sad that she said all those things because it took up all the oxygen in the room. And then I didn't get to have the conversation I wanted to with the other woman that was there. And I feel really sad about that. And then we can feel that it's in, and then you're absolutely right. I mean, this doesn't, we move through it, right? Yeah. We are not the emotions They're they're The emotions are just information on our dashboard. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, 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 to process. I like that with the anger, because I think when you do get to the bottom of it and you look in that situation, I know I've been in some situations even recently. And when you sit in that moment and allow it to be, it sometimes it's like, they're not even related why you're feeling that way, why that pent up stuff. It's, it's like, oh, I was pissed off about this thing that happened. 
And now this person said that and it triggered something in my body because I hadn't dealt with, I hadn't worked through that one, right? Where, like you say, if you could just sit in that emotion when it happened the first place, you may have, it may, you may have still had that same emotion. Yeah. But it may yeah, have. I think, it's I, I think what you've, what you've just said about, especially that we're triggered, right? This is such a buzz topic. And, and I, I, I think the way that we've shifted mostly, not all of us, but in society of like, you triggered me, mm -hmm. you did something triggered me, I, I think is, the, is, is not necessarily the, the healthiest way to to go on that because exactly what you just said like oh something happened i got triggered Tr triggered on it on its own is such it's such violent language um and so i <laughs> i like to use like touched and awakened something has happened that has touched and awakened something i mean it's now creating some energy and motion some emotions are happening in my body right so i uh, i was in a situation somebody said something it touched and awakened something in me and i now need to take responsibility for that now when we have been touched and awakened, it's kind of the first sign that we've moved from our adult integrated consciousness into our child consciousness, something old that is probably unresolved. Yeah. So then you kind of go, oh, this has nothing to do. I'm making up names. This has nothing to do with Joanna and Stacy. This actually has to do with that thing my brother did to me when we were little that I just, I just, no one ever witnessed. No one ever saw it. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Oh, and so what if I just felt that? What if I felt that little girl part of me that was like, oh, that's why I do that. Cause I felt so alone and I'll do anything to not feel like I'm alone. Oh, what if I just felt alone? What if I companion myself now right away? I'm not alone because I'm there and the little me is there. And there's belonging. How do I companion myself through this? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you mentioned the, the second book I wrote, Everything Left to Remember. You know, there's a lot in there about, you know, anger. You know, I was angry at my mom for a variety of different things that had happened through our life. Now, she was in the throes of Alzheimer's. It didn't make a lot of sense to get angry at her <laughs> or, or to, <laughs> to express anger, right, at her. But the anger was still there. And I needed to have outlets to express it. So, okay, I'm going to go and, you know, yell in the car when the car door is closed, or I'm going to have a bath and scream underwater, or I'm going to hit a pillow or whatever, and, and kind of move it through my body, make a sound and emotion to move it through my body so that I can come to the place where I'm, I'm increased my capacity. What I mean by that is that there's enough spacious inside of me to know I have and had this anger and that's okay. And I had and have this love for her. And that's okay. That we don't need to cut off the anger to be like, I don't feel that because I'm supposed to just love her. You know, both. And <laughs> we're, bigger. we're bigger. We can hold and endure more of that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think so. Well, what I, and what I felt when I was reading it, I could, you know, you could feel by the way that you, like you're, write very well so you could really feel your emotions in that like like you could feel that like I want to be there and I want to spend this time with my mom and and you know compassion because like how must she be feeling in her own body when she can't even recognize this and then like you said anger all at the same time and how do I work through this and I I really loved it because I loved how you went into nature and you you had such a beautiful experience with her in the end that you did yeah. take that memory back right so yeah. yeah yeah I mean that was such a part of the book right there's no mother that I know who's bigger than my own other than mother nature and mm -hmm. I think I was really really looking for a container large enough to hold us and all of the complexity of us and all of the complexity of the disease itself in a way that we both felt held by a mother in a way mm -hmm. and could have enough space to kind of rumble with these big questions, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I, and I mean, I can relate because I mean, if I obviously had a relationship with my own mom and I think that's, it's, you know, it's interesting doing this with her because, 
you know, we both have our experiences with it. And yeah, you you have all these different emotions. And I'm sure she does sometimes, you know, I mean, we're always grateful and we're, you know, love that we get to do these things, but we have our other emotions too in our own lives and our, you know, there's lots of compact things that in, are involved in all of this. So yeah, I, I, thought you, I thought you did say it very beautifully in your book. Thank you. Beautiful life, very nice. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, and that's a hard thing, right? Like Alzheimer's and things like that, the, they're hard. And I know like my mom is dealing with that with my grandma now. She's got a little bit of onset Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you know so she talks to her more than I do so I can feel when she's talking to me about things those things of you know the anger same things right the anger the frustration the love the complexity of it all right so yeah you know it's really interesting I think um this <laughs> this this I I, I read a, a myth actually it's an old ancient Egyptian myth and I won't get into the entirety of the myth, but there was a part in it that involved this like um, remembering of, a, you know, the ancient Egyptians were pretty gory, just like the Romans. And so this person had been like dismembered in the myth and then, and then they were being remembered. Mm -hmm. And there was something when I read that and I saw it spelt R E dash membered, remembered. And I, and everything that I was kind of dancing in, in, in Alzheimer's and memory and memory loss, it kind of clicked for me. And that's, that's a lot of what I came to was like, oh, we have to be remembered. Our bodies, mental, physical, emotional are just all over the place. Society has made it such that it's not very fun, safe, et cetera. It's better for women to be at war with their own bodies than friends with their own bodies. Mm -hmm. Let's put their mental bodies in the future and give them all these things to worry about. Let's put their emotions in the past. You know, we're all over the place. That's that remembering. Mm -hmm. And I might lose my actual memory when I get older. And the more and more I can practice being inside of all of my bodies at once at the same time, the clearer and swifter and slower and stiller and faster the paradoxes, right, all come in. And for me, that's that's created a, a bit of a guidepost, a bit of a light for me of like, that's my work. That's, you know, and, and so much of it has come from watching the way that my mom was dismembered through her life in various different ways, just like, you know, so many of us are. Mm -hmm. And, and kind of a commitment to self to come into that kind of presence and a commitment to, and a devotion to helping other people come into that kind of presence. Yeah. And I, I would, I think that it's important that we do live in the present, right? Like I, I often think when I'm having a bad day and my, you know, I allow that sadness and that worry and everything to impact my day. And it's hard to find that presence in that moment and be like, Ooh, let, like you just said, let me sit in that. Right. It, it's easier to just get enveloped by that bad feeling. And so I think it's important that people like you are out there doing this mission to get people to understand right if we just sit in that presence and be grateful for what we have and just feel what we're feeling and work through that I think that's really important yeah yeah very true and not allowing others to push those emotions on us either you know uh because that is a, a main stream in a day I find because people have a tendency to push names or label things around you which can also make you have the emotions you don't want to feel i'm getting really good at that so i just go oh no you don't. that's not happening to me um you know and walk away from it because i just don't want to have the time for that because uh -huh. it's not my emotion it's something they're trying to tell me it's my emotion right so i'm going uh -uh, uh -uh, it's not mine that you're that's yours that you're trying to push to me um, and I'm not feeling that. <laughs> yes. But congratulations. Right? It's beautiful. The discernment. The discernment yes. of what is mine. 
and what is not mine? That's, that's actually been a long time favorite question of mine is, is this mine? Is this mine? Is this feeling mine? Is this thought pattern mine? I didn't come into the world with this. <laughs> Where, right. who did this? Who gave me this? You know, who's is this now? And especially with people who are sensitive to energy and to emotions and, and sensations in the room. It's a beautiful question to ask. Is this mine? And, and then to kind of, if it isn't, be like, okay, it's that person's and they get to take it and they get to hold it. They get to be responsible. We can be kind. We can be supportive. Yeah. There's a, you know, that I, I was thinking about this a while back, the, the phrase, like, I feel for you. You know how we use it? We're just like, oh my yeah. gosh. <laughs> And, and I've actually, I've actually intentionally stopped using that phrase because I'm like, no, I feel for my, I feel for myself. You feel for you <laughs> yeah. and I can support you and I can see you and I can witness and all those things, but I, I can't feel for you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can imagine. <laughs> I like that because I like, even, even for you to say with the triggered thing to be awakened and touched and to be like. Right. Because we say these things, I think so often, and I'm a true believer in this is our words have so much power and we're saying these things. And so, yeah, like if you take that literally, I feel for you, you're like, yeah, give me all your crap. I'm going to take it. On. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I actually don't want to. Right. right? right? I'll witness yeah. You all sit in your space yeah. with you, but that's your feeling. Yeah. That's gonna right. We can say, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. What does that feel like? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, it, it's, it is really about being, I think, the conscious about how we're living every day and every moment that we live. Yeah, and, and to know that, you know, it's an impossibility for us to do it 24 seven. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> you no, know, that there's going to be, you know, I, I say this a lot. There, there's a, there's a profundity to a lot of, and, and a gravity to a lot of the work. Like, you know, I take, I take my own personal work seriously, but, and like try to take it not at all seriously. You know, we're also here to have fun and to mess up and to learn stuff and then totally forget it and then mess up again and then learn it again. I mean, this is like the human experience. So <laughs> how do we do this and commit ourselves and create devotions and take things seriously? And also with the gravity and the profundity of things also have levity as the, as the counterbalance. You know, as you said, words are so important. I, I love the idea of spell casting and I do think words are they cast spells and like it's yeah. quite something and I think of like counterbalances I think of like counter spells like if I'm gonna go for a life that has a lot of that kind of depth and breadth then I also need to know how to come up for air and have a giggle you know yeah. that needs to be part of of um you know my my the counter spell the counter devotion um to, to that yeah yeah a hundred percent because I don't think we can be even as spiritual beings and if we're more sensitive and things that we can't be a hundred percent on all the time right mm -hmm. and and I mean that was certainly a lesson I've learned over this last couple of years is like it's okay to not be perfect it's okay to not be on and a hundred percent all the time and and yeah it's it's okay to live in my own body and my own feelings in that particular moment and so I think you conveyed that really well to everybody that you know yeah I mean we're here to have a human experience a hundred. We're, not, we're not here to like practice some perfect unflawed spiritual experience we're here to be humans and humans are messy humans have um darkness and light and everything in between and it's it's you know for me it, much of it feels like you know a big experiment of dancing with all of that. Yeah. Yeah, you know? absolutely. So if you could give a piece of advice to the followers or words of wisdom or something that you'd like to leave the followers with, what would that be? Hmm. That's a really beautiful question. You know, I've been thinking a lot about advice and expertise and, and wisdom, and especially with the rise of social media and how we 
how we utilize it uh, nowadays is a lot of people telling other people the things that they know. I know this, 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 I know this. And I am so much more interested in questions than answers. And in explorations of one's own knowings, as opposed to here's the to-do list of the 10 things of how to get you through your day. Um, although those can be helpful sometimes. Yep. yep. And so my advice, I suppose, with that would be a question, which is what is the largest question you can live into? today are the questions you are asking in your own life large enough for the flourishing that you desire good one that's good yeah nice. yeah and i'd love us to rumble around with questions you know and, and to give a tangible example of this you know it's so easy nowadays especially with like ai and um chat GPT and all these things and even the internet to kind of go, what does a red fox look like? And it pops up an image and we're just shown right away. It's such a different thing, you know, to go on a walk every day in the forest where I live and, and think, I wonder what a red fox looks like. I wonder, I wonder where they live and how they, what they smell and what they eat. And, and then, I don't know, a month later, five years later, seeing a red fox. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It takes your breath away. Yeah. And so exactly. that's the kind of like, I wonder if we were able to, it goes back to endurance. Can I endure a space of unknowing? And can I ask large enough questions inside of that to, to live into it with largeness and flourishing? That, that would be my um, question, advice posed as a question, I suppose. <laughs> I like that. That's beautiful. I think I think that's a good thing for people to ponder. And so I think I appreciate or we appreciate that you said that and gave people that thought to think about, right? Because yes. yes. Yeah. And if they need something more tangible, you know, pee when you have to go pee and drink water when you have to go uh, drink water. <laughs> Yeah, remember that. <laughs> yeah, that is so true because I can't tell you how many times I come home and I say to my I'm, my husband's like okay hey, good gives me a kiss and I'm like wait 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 I have to pee I've had to pee for the last like three hours he's like why didn't you go I'm like I don't know <laughs> right? right yeah I'm also gonna stop on the way since I tell you that and you know do some yeah. things before I actually make yeah. it there yeah. it'll be done <laughs> that's right <laughs> That's true. Oh, that's great. So can you tell everybody where to find you? Absolutely. Well, uh, they can find me on my website, stephjagger.com. There is a newsletter that I do every month called Everything Left. And it's a piece of personal narrative writing and prompts and offerings and everything I'm up to. I am occasionally speaking of foxes. I feel like I'm a little bit of a fox on Instagram, like fleeting. And is she there? Is she along the edges? And but I, I do plan on making myself a little bit more visible there um, over the next handful of months or so. So we'll see. But really, the website and the newsletter are the best ways to stay in touch with what I've got going on and how to be involved um, in in all of the different really the, the work that people are doing that I happen to be a witness of. Yeah. Perfect. Well, wonderful. Well, it's been such a pleasure talking to you. This hour has flown by. So as um, it ever. <laughs> we really appreciate you giving this insight to us and our followers. And we'd love you to come back sometime and share space with us again. So thank you so much. Well, yes, absolutely. thank you. Lots of food for thought there for us as well as the listeners. And I thank you too. Oh, well, I thank you both so much for creating this space, holding this space. You, I said, I like big questions and you asked them. And so I'm, I'm really, I'm grateful to the both of you. Uh, right back at you. <laughs> yes. And everybody else tune in next week. You bet.